we have uh, 10 to 15 minutes for a Q&A session. So I'm going to invite Louise and uh, Peter back uh, onto the virtual stage. Hi, hey, Louise and Peter should be back also in a second. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the q and A. I I see uh, a few people have done that already, which is awesome. Uh, if you're just joining the conference, I hope you're enjoying the uh, conversations. Um, this is a short uh, Q&A, and then uh, we'll be heading into uh, the first happy hour. Um, Luis, there were a lot of questions uh, for you. Uh, so I'll start uh, with that. And um, the first question that uh, came up was how uh, to measure trust? What are some indicators that you use? I think trust is it's kind of a strange thing to measure. Um, there are official metrics to measure it from. Um, I think one is uh, uh, having an open customer service, for example. That's one thing that we've worked quite a bit with. We've opened with open feedback, um, where we measure it uh, based on comments, um, people leaving your service. That is definitely a, a, um, a measure of distrust, um, depending on the scale of the service that you're, you're creating. Obviously, um, engagement your service is a metric, uh, the more engagement, the, the higher the level of trust. Um, now, I don't think what's interesting isn't necessarily just how much people are trusting your service, but it's actually, is it worth trusting? So is it, I mean, just because people trust it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a product worth trusting. So, you know, the mm -hmm. metric is important, but not alpha omega. Hmm. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of uh, indirect ways to measure trust. It's really hard to, of course, grasp it uh, right away. Um, again, if people have questions regarding the last few uh, talks, leave them in the chats. Um, I don't see uh, questions yet for the other speakers, so I'll continue with you uh, for a moment, Luis. Um, yeah, here's... Um, here, here's another interesting uh, practical challenge. How can we convince our organizations to prioritize trust in situations where it might run counter to uh, uh, the immediate value to the business? I think that's a really interesting question. It's, it's, I think it's one of the rebellions that I've been up against with a lot of organizations. I work at an agency, so I have quite a few commercial uh, or large commercial uh, corporations that that don't see trust as something that is Im implicitly important to design into a product. Um, they see it as sort of an after effect that you manipulate users into trusting your product. I saw one of the questions in the Q&A also, whether you manipulate or you inspire to have people trust your, your products. Um, I think one way of convincing them is, is, I think one of the things that I mentioned in my speak was, was that we are in this distributed era of trust, um, meaning you can't really, design products any longer that aren't trustworthy. I mean, and I think the more uh, you see the consequences that 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 products that haven't been trustworthy, um, the consequences to the companies that are launching them um, are so detrimental to them and to their shareholders that, that I think that that is enough to convince quite a few uh, stakeholders. I mean, I know that, that I've been contacted quite a bit by companies because of the trust that 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 I um, specialize in designing. So, so I think it's becoming more evident. Just like ethics is becoming more evident, um, I think trust is becoming more evident as an important aspect of our product design. Okay, thanks, uh, Cassie. A question now for you: um, What advice would you give about designing uh, in co-creation with the humanitarian sector? Yeah. Here, um, great question. I think this begs whether with humanitarian sector as an aid organization or UN bodies or government or the affected community themselves. Um, so this is like very two different approach. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, but I think I can say for the affected community first, I would say um, it is so first thing first is um, like meaningful consent. So just as Louis said and many others had said, it is really important that we you explain the full scope of what you are co-creating this for and what this could be, be evolving into and what it may not, because it's really important that we 
any false promises. And then, um, and then make sure that we are not using any jargons or any of our pre-existing um, prejudice about, okay, people would know this. Okay, people would not know this. But then really try to decipher everything as much as possible. And then another important thing to remember is I, as I said at the last takeaway for my talk, it's like admitting and accepting. I may not be the best person to design all these experiences, despite the however many user research and background research that I do. Like, yeah, so really questioning that as well. Mm. And then related to that, a question was, are there any go-to guidelines that help us to find the, the privileged blind spots when we are thinking through our design choices? Because it's really, you don't know what you don't know. So how do we, yeah, how do we uncover those blind spots? Any tips on that? Yeah, so obviously there are um, some of the usual ones, like uh, the ones that come from gender, race, ethnicity, and your upbringing. But then I, so we often think we get trained in um, uncovering these biases and how do we make sure that this doesn't affect us in designing our services for the affected population. But I am constantly challenged too. And one example that I've had was, I was um, part of a project which was to make aid distribution a lot more efficient. And then this was basically a database project. And then like this sounded like a great idea. We will be a lot more transparent. There would be much less corruption and people would get what they need much quicker. And then one um, community member that I didn't had asked post me this question was like, what is your right to know every service or every experience that we've had since the conflict that's been ongoing for the past five years? And honestly, I did not have a good answer to that because this was a privileged space that I had never considered and no one ever challenged me on this. So I think there's, um, there are some, I, I think there's already a really good guidelines on um, race, gender, ethnicity, cultural, um, cultural like blind spots, spots. But then I think the most important thing is really always have open ears when you get challenged and accept that I didn't think about this, like, but I will do it on going from now. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, being open and surrounding yourself with people who are different than yourself is probably already a very good uh, starting point. You know, we don't have any questions for you yet. Your presentation was so clear. We know everything we want to well, know about Switzerland. It was just a quiz. It was just a <laughs> quiz. And there were all the answers there. So it's okay. <laughs> I think the theme uh, of this block is really about the responsibility that we have as um, as designers. That's coming through in Doris' uh, talk and uh, Cassie and uh, Louise, your talk as well. Um, so let's see. We have, we have some more time. Um, Here's a question from Max to you, Louisa. Um, so maybe the world needs uh, designers of trust, impact, and relationships. Can we use service design for this? Of course we can. I mean, we're designing services that in essence, I mean, in many aspects sort of enable relationships and enable the, the I mean, the, the contact, I mean, just like Cassie was in on, you know, I mean, it, it enables people to communicate, enables people to, um, get aid and enables people to get um, access to financial services. I mean, these are relationships that we're establishing that were prior uh, seen in a different way. So service designers, I think, um, with our ability to study human needs and to sort of um, be the fighters of human needs and, and um, being the user's um, ardent voice, I think definitely service design is, should be moving towards trust um, tr being trust designers and, and designers of relationships, most definitely, yes. Yeah, it should be part of the, it should already be part of the process. It should be the, the default option, hopefully. Um, I think it is a natural part of our sort of existence. I think we're all service designers for a reason that it's to create change. I mean, yeah, and the, the, I hope 
I think the point that you're making is we can do it implicitly or we can uh, think uh, explicitly consciously. and consciously yeah. about it. And that's, yeah. uh, that makes a big difference. Um, Peter, there is actually a, there is a question for you. And, and that, that's what is uh -oh. the state of uh, trust and design in Switzerland? How do you connect to Luis and Cassie's talk? In trust uh, in Switzerland. Trust and design in Switzerland. Yes, trust what is the state? I can... It's a quite specific question, um, but I can I can relate to trust uh, maybe in, in some degree. So, um, uh, as you pointed out, one of the main things that I wanted people to take away, which is were included in the first question, is that Switzerland's uh, governance model is a co-creative model, meaning that literally every uh, Swiss person has the right uh, to to challenge a law that comes out of the parliament, and if people bound together, then they can write an addition into the constitution of the country. So these are very uh, strong points. And this has been going on in Switzerland for in various forms since around 170 years. So it's a very well established uh, element. And the if you look at the trust in government of Swiss people, then contrary to many other countries in the world, not only is it one of the strongest ones, but it is also growing and has been growing in the past years. Whereas in uh, other countries, we've seen a, a disillusionment from government, maybe, uh, in, the, in the past years. And Switzerland is a, a contrary uh, element. Now, I don't know, you know how much co-creation or the involvement uh, specifically of, of the citizens has to do with this. I would wager that it has a strong part in it because people see that the government is sort of really acting on their behalf and they have the opportunity to co-create, to have a say in it. And you know that engenders trust. So you know, hopefully, that uh, to some regard answers the question. Hmm. I think so. I think so. Um, and on that note, I'm going to thank you for joining me in the session. Uh, we're going to slowly transition in the into the afternoon here uh, in the Netherlands and in Switzerland, Denmark, uh, and in Berlin uh, as well. Um, some people are just joining in for for the conference. Um, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, Cassie. Once more, thank you, Dory, for being the first uh, keynote. Um, a few household household uh, reminders. Um, let's see uh, what I have for you. Um, yeah, of course, uh, in the break, this is our first happy hour. <laughs> yeah, for some people, uh, it is. So uh, choose a beverage of your choice. You can, of course, visit the eBoots in um, uh, Brella. Uh, see what, uh, what you can do there, uh, connect with the other people. Um, now, for me, that's the end of my two blocks. It was an honor to, uh, to host this with you. Like um, Alex mentioned early this morning, it feels uh, uh, a long time away, but I really want to recognize some of the partners of this event uh, without their support even this online uh, edition of the service design global conference wouldn't be uh, possible so thank you to uh, Deloitte, Fjord, Mural, More Than Metrics, Bridgeable, Designed, uh, Creative Reaction Lab, Helon, Optimal Workshop, Harmonic, the Service Design Podcast and the Service Design Show. And of course, some of the academic partners like the Chiba University, Cork Institute of Technology, Loria, Polytechnical, Milano, SCAT, and the Service Design uh, Lab. Now, like I said, these are the final seconds of my uh, participation with you. I'm going to leave you in the hands of Marina Teterian. Uh, Marina is design leader uh, and educator and at the Y Lab in Los Angeles, and she's the host of the Y Service Design Thinking podcast, and she calls service design her extreme sport. She'll be uh, in after the break um, from my end. Uh, all that's left to say is enjoy the rest of the conference, enjoy the break, and uh, I'll be happy to connect with you on whatever platform you wish to. So see you soon. Thanks. Good to have you, Mark. Ciao.